So hopefully you see um, the presentation. And just by way of introduction, um, I think what makes um, this particular occasion kind of stand out is not that I just hear, heard that it's the first one that actually is taking off, place offline and online, but also the fact that there are elections coming up in Hungary in three weeks time. Um, so it's actually going to be the third election after Orban's ascent to power. And as, uh, as Doro said, I've been following also what happened previously. So before the right wing emerged, fourth? I think it's the fourth. Well, 20, well, yeah, 2010, 2014, 2018, you're right. It's the fourth already. They've been in power for 12 years, the magical number. So yes, my, my work has been following basically the, the, the making of what I call right wing hegemony. And I use these Gramscian concepts. I'll explain a bit why, but I think they, they do make a lot of sense. Um, and as you mentioned, my book focused primarily on understanding the pre-Orban period. So what I would call this the erosion of the left wing or left liberal um, hegemony. Hegem 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 <laughs> and then since the publication of the book and actually before that, I've been trying to understand how does such a regime become consolidated? Why is it so strong? Um, and not only in terms of popularity, um, and I do say that I expect uh, Fidesz, the ruling party, to win this election, but also in terms of the consent that it has been able to generate, um, specifically in rural areas. So as Doro, as Doro mentioned, my work does specifically deal with rural areas, and I think for a very good reason, this is where Orban's base is actually. And if you look at the last elections, you see that actually this urban rural divide has been gaining in strength. It's become stronger and stronger and stronger. What that translate, translates into is that people who are like me, let's say urban intellectuals have very few friends who vote, vote for Fidesz, very, very few. And most of my friends ask me that they say, I don't understand why people vote for these, this party. I truly don't. And then there are people who I work with in the countryside who live a hundred kilometers from me. And there, I actually don't know almost everyone who, were, who would vote for the opposition. So really these are split, wor these are split worlds, um, especially the villages and the big city. Um, in the larger cities and mid-sized towns, the, the picture is a bit more blurred, blurred, but really the villages have become kind of the, the bastions of, 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 of this regime. And in my talk and in my work, I'll try to understand and explain a bit what I've come to um, as to why this is. Um, so I just want to begin by saying that, you know, if you read about Hungary, you're likely to come across the word authoritarian and this picture of the authoritarian charismatic leader. And my work deliberately tries to displace the guy from view, um, not because I don't think that this literature is valuable, I think it is, but I think it does miss an important part of the picture. Because um, what we're getting from analysis of authoritarian, authoritarianism is an idea that there is, a, this, this is a society that um, is dominated by repression, the fusion of the state and civil society, but definitely minimally on an equal playing field between a hegemonic party and its opponents. Um, so that's one of the understandings of authoritarianism, and this, this literature, I mean, is really very strong in political science, um, and I'm saying great, I mean, I have lots of respect for this work, don't get me wrong, and I, if you look at the slide, you see people who I think, um, were, whose work should be followed, and then there's another branch which treats authoritarianism in a slightly different way, but treats it as exclusionary populism. So the, 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 the grand, and that's why I put the picture on the right on the slide, the, the really this iconic moment is the closing of Hungary's border during the refugee crisis and then the scapegoating of the refu refugees. So the external other and uniting society against minorities and external others. Um, so that's, that's maybe we could call the first institutional authoritarianism and the second social cultural. But really, I think this is what's dominating the narrative on Hungary. And I think what's lacking from this picture, and really all due respect, so again, not to say that this literature is not valid, is the lack of attention to what I would call everyday quiet consent, 
So what's happening in the banal everyday lives of people, and also when people go to vote, you know, they it's it's no longer about ideology most of the time. When I ask people in the countryside why they support Fidesz, they start often by telling me, presumably because they know me already or they can position me as an intellectual, by saying that they don't agree with this and this and this and this that Orban has done, but they'll, they'll nevertheless vote for him. Um, and then there come different arguments coming from often financial incentives that they're better off. Often it goes around refugees, but often around, and this is what I'll be focusing on, deep transformations in their own lives that they see as positive. And so this is why I talk about consent. This, is, this comes from Gramsci, um, or we could also call it social legitimacy. Um, as a synonym. So what is very briefly this Gramscian perspective on authoritarian leadership and politics? So I think the bottom line or the one of the key things is that consent is also a key factor in authoritarian regimes. Authoritarian regimes do not only rely on coercion, intimidation, um, the teaching of political lessons to citizens to stay away from politics or certain kinds of politics, although that's part of the picture but they genuinely need to convince the people that they have a social project, which is coherent and legible. So that people understand why they're doing what they're doing and that it's visible in their everyday lives, the transformation from one regime to the other, that there is a relative success of some of their key undertakings, that some of the promises they, 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 they do, and I'll talk about the promise of restoring order as a key promise of the regime. And third, but and certainly not least, and this really was stressed by Gramsci, that there has to be a recognizable moral dimension of the leadership and its societal project and a degree of coherence with everyday common sense. I'll talk more about what this common sense is in terms of my own research, specifically what it means in a village um, or in villages. Um, dominated by representatives of the post-peasantry, as I'll call them. So people whose ancestors were peasants, people who still click to the, or, or, or have a strong affiliation to the land, but not, do not necessarily work the land. And there's a particular uh, moral economy around these um, social configurations that I think is very important for understanding why people see Orban's project as worthy of respect and of support or minimum credibility. Um, so the key question that I'll be asking and that I've been also pursuing in this paper uh, that Doro mentioned is how do authoritarians mobilize the legal bureaucratic monetary resources of the state to generate consent when they're in power? Previously, I looked at how authoritarians vitalize and mobilize civil society, and I think that's also very important to generate consent. Um, but here I'll focus on this second, so using the state and its resources to generate consent. And more specifically, coming back to what I said, so how do authoritarians, or do they, offer fixes to long-standing social problems and crises? And my answer will be that they do, um, even if these fixes are always temporary and in many ways inefficient, but deeply popular often. And lastly, but not least, before I, I jump into um, the analysis, so I'm an anthropologist, and I think you know, our, you know, this, this discipline is populist by nature, and by that I mean it tries to understand people's everyday life worlds, aspirations. Um, so it's a grassroots thing that we do, and I think this is why it's quite well placed to look at this banal everyday aspect of, of statecraft, of authoritarian statecraft and its reception in society. Um, so the focus of what I'll be talking about today is the government's so-called public work program. It's often called a workfare program and I'll, I'll use the two terms interchangeably. But the reason I don't always talk of workfare is because workfare has a very particular connotation in the literature. Mostly this is sociology and social policy literature and often workfare is associated with the Anglo-Saxon neoliberal model. So their workfare is about pushing unskilled people into the arms of capital as cheaply as possible by withdrawing and retrenching the welfare state. 
It's getting people back to work, but back to work in a specific way on the primary labor market. Um, if you read the literature about the US, it's very prominent there, but also um, since the rise of Thatcherism, also in Britain, there's a huge literature on British workfare. And you will see that Hungary's workfare program is not exactly that type of workfare program. It does share certain traits. Um, and I'll say why and what, but it's not a neoliberal model. Um, you could call it a post-neoliberal um, or an illiberal model. Um, the words are less important than the fact that it's different um, and you'll see how and why. So my core argument will be that workfare, or let's call it public work, has boosted the government's social legitimacy, specifically in rural areas, by reestablishing a sense of order and social harmony in the, and this is important, in the aftermath of a great crisis. I refer here to the Great Recession. You know, this is the what we could also call the, the great economic crisis um, starting in 2008, lasting until, well, 2012, 13, and some places even later, such as Greece. And this triggered an economic, a social, and a moral crisis. And I'll stress the social and moral aspect. Um, and so I think I'll jump right in. I just want to say that, as I said, what I'll be saying is based on ethnographic field work in two localities, but I'll only really talk about one of them. It's the village where this workfare program was launched, was relaunched by Fides in 2011, a year after it came to power. Um, and that's what gives it its symbolic resonance, um, that there's a reason why uh, the government th thought that this is the right place to announce the program and start a model program. Of course, I also surveyed the literature, I mean, the empirical literature on Hungarian workfare, and I engage with, as I said, the theorizations of workfare outside Hungary. Um, so I'll talk about what, why, and how. What is public work? Why was public work introduced in a second stage? And how does public work generate consent? These are the three things I want to talk about. And then I'll have some concluding points or lessons. So this is a long slide, and um, I, but I just really wanted to give you an overview. And there'll also be pictures, because I think it's important for you to see actually what workfare is in practice. So importantly, it's not FIDAS that launched this program, but in 2009, it was the social liberal government which began experimenting with this workfare policy. It was called the Road to Work program, and I think also already the name speaks volumes. It was about leading unskilled people back to work. Um, and there was this reason, which I'll go into at a later point, about why the social liberal government felt the necessity to introduce this program. For now, I want to focus on what it was. So, and again, 2009 is a landmark uh, year, but there were public work programs prior to that, I just want to stress. And what this program achieved was actually more than quadrupling the amount of people who worked in this program. So there were 90,000 un uh, mostly long-term unemployed people who took part in what? in a state, so a, a central state finance program that was run by local municipalities in the most economically depressed areas. This is the period of the Great Recession when unemployment is highest in Hungary, everywhere else. And so with the help of these central state funds, the municipalities used this labor force, and these people were out of work for very long years, most of them, to tidy the streets, cut firewood for the elderly, um, basically making small repairs to villages that were quite, quite decrepit and, and clearly, you know, in this stage, on a downwards trajectory in many ways. So it was a clever program, I would say, to show local rural people that the state is back. Um, it's there to help. And I spoke to the Minister of Social Affairs back in the time, and really what he told me is that they were terribly afraid of losing the socialist mayors. That's why they started this program in specifically northeastern Hungary. But it wasn't enough to keep the voters on the side of the socialists, because in just a year after the program started, Fidesz won a tremendous victory with two-thirds two of the vote. 
And very quickly, Orban announced that they would not only keep this program, but extend it and revamp it, making it actually the number one cornerstone of social policy in Hungary. Um, so you have to understand this new program in the context of really drastic changes to the social policy regime. And I just wrote a few of these points because it's impossible to do justice to really this massive transformation. But the crux of it was already mentioned by Orban in the, during the election period when he said that he will transform and do away with the welfare state and instead create a work-based state or society, but mostly society. And it's actually, this is a term that derives from rural mayors. So it's something Orban appropriated from grassroots political discourse, classic authoritarian populist strategy, um, and then said, this is actually going to be my key undertaking in rural areas. I'm, big, big, I'm, I'm building a new society here. And the cornerstone of this society is based on, I mean, if I want to turn to common sense, I would say um, we have a saying in Hungary, you only get, only those who work get bread. That's more or less the translation. The rest of the people don't deserve bread. Um, and I guess you understand what that means. It means cutting welfare. And you'll see from my analysis of the particular village and its history, that there was a process of marginalization of particularly unskilled Roma. Um, and this message was meant to resonate with the people who were fed up with these unskilled work welfare scroungers, that they shouldn't have access to welfare benefits anymore. And if you look at social policy, a number of areas, even the constitution, um, mentioning the constitution, maybe it's important to know that Orban removed the right to social welfare from the constitution. Um, and instead put in place only a mild pledge that the state will try to uphold um, a minimum of social security, but no rights, no social rights. Um, and then there were other reforms, which I don't really want to go into in detail, but the massive reduction of unemployment assistance from nine to three months, the shortest period in the EU, um, and a number of other things that really made basically the poorest people who had been out of work for a very long time, totally dependent on this workfare policy. It meant that they could only have access to any kind of welfare benefits if they worked for the local community under the authority of the mayors. And I'll argue that this is really a massive transformation because it creates patron-client ties between mayors and the poor. So instead of the poor having you know, a universal welfare state catering to them badly or not badly, but mostly badly before, you now have mayors who get to decide if people can take part in a program, which is their only chance of basically accessing any kind of welfare or almost any kind of welfare. If you're not in the program, you can have 100 euros per month um, for you and your family to survive. So it's not a lot if you're not in the program. Um, there was a special minimum wage for the public workers. I think that's very important symbolically that they get a minimum wage, but it's 30% below the normal minimum wage. In this respect, I would say that the program resembles the US or the British workfare policy, which also tries to stigmatize people who are on the dole, people who are on um, you know, welfare benefits, um, they don't get as much. Um, they are not, there is a, there's this moral aspect of stigmatizing them and this substandard wa wage is one way of doing that, of, of stigmatizing people who enter the program. Um, and, and I think it's important to point out, but then I'll try to finish off this at a glance section that Hungary was the country in the EU that spent the most of its resources in terms of GDP, half a percent of its GDP on workfare. So way before the others or way in front of the others. And just to, for you to get an idea of the scope of the program in its peak year, there were more than 200,000 people employed. That's 2% of the whole population. Um, so that's a much larger percent of the workforce. I would say that's four or 5% of the 4% of the workforce which is again, very, very high. 
Um, and the general consensus on this in the scholarship is that where workfare should be treated as a punitive neoliberal policy that stigmatizes the poor um, and, uh, and, and we'll see also punishes them. And what I'll try to show is that it's more complicated. Actually, we see a, sh we see a shift from punishment towards what I'll call reincorporation. And I'll say what that is a bit later. Um, here, I just have a map of the country. Um, the arrow points to my field site. And if you look at the greens, um, the greens show the ratio of the public workforce. So wherever it's darker, there's more public workers um, per the total workforce. So you'll see that Northeastern Hungary and Southwestern Hungary are the two regions that stand out. And this is because this is where long-term employed are really present or make up a very large percentage of the population. And this is also what we call the, um, in, in Hungarian, the, the lying eight, this, where most of the Roma population is concentrated. So Northeast and Southwest, but predominantly the Northeast. Now I come to the local part, the ethnography. Um, so try, I'm trying to give you an idea of the village where the program was launched and why it was launched there. And I'll try to also explain basically a bit the micro history of this place because I think it's kind of representative of the of wider rural areas in this area where there's lots of Roma and unskilled workers. So in 2011 in March, just a few months before the workfare program was relaunched by Orban, there was a paramilitary intervention in this village. And that meant that there was a very, there is a strong far right party with which Orban's Fidesz competed in 2010 for control of rural Hungary. And this was an extremist racist party whose main political platform was political anti-Gypsyism. And what they said was basically they blamed the whole crisis, the great recession and what they called the stolen transition of 1989 on Roma. There's, they basically said that Roma are preying on hardworking Hungarians and the state has done nothing to curb this welfare scrounging and the thievery that Roma have, had been accused of. And that they promised that they will restore order because if the liberal state is not willing to do anything against these um, undeserving populations, then they will. And they mimic the state. So if you look at both of these pictures, you see people in uniform. These are right-wing activists, far right-wing activists. Um, some of them members of this Yobik party, but others a member of a paramilitary organization called the Hungarian Guard, which organized a very long campaign from 2007 in, in villages inhabited by Roma and non-Roma attempting to polarize these communities along ethnic lines, basically getting Hungarians to come out strongly against Roma and intimidating the Roma. And they came to this village. I'm not writing the name because it's complicated, but Jönjespata is the name. It's really only 100 kilometers from Budapest, 3,000 people, not more. And what made this, this intervention particular is that they stayed for three weeks. Um, the police let them do patrols, basically stand in for the state. Um, you see the guards patrolling on the left-hand picture. So basically following Roma to the shop so that they don't steal. Um, and I'll say a bit more about this thievery because um, it was not something that was invented, only really expanded by the far right. Um, but there were deep social problems in these communities. And so actually this is the reason that the government decided to launch or relaunch Workfair um, in 2011 in this particular locality because it wanted to show that <clears throat> Yobik's program was not the best place program to, for rural inhabitants. And one more important point that Yobik did not only stay for two weeks, but they forced the mayor to resign and then won the by-election that was organized in July. So that's important. That's why Fidesz felt 
that they needed to take this particular locality back. They could not leave it to the far right because it was too symbolic, too iconic. And they also felt that the far right was gonna use this as a staging ground to show the rest of villagers in Hungary that what they're doing in this village is the right way to go. And what they did is this policy, is what I call in the paper punitive populism, is really using workfare in a very punitive manner, um, following people around and harassing the public workers, throwing them out of the program, also using the police to, um, to basically um, throw out um, financial penalties on Roma for very minor things such as um, not having a backlight when they were riding their bicycle or throwing a cigarette stub on the pavement. So really um, nothing issues, but it was really a strategy to show that this was the party that was the most punitive and that it would restore order. And Orban's approach to workfare was to show that there was another way of restoring order that was not necessarily so punitive. So now I want to go a bit back in time because I need you to understand, or I want you to understand a bit, what are these social conflicts that I'm talking of? Um, why does a party talk of thievery and welfare scrounging and all that? And I, of course, uh, I mean, I wrote a book about this, so it's hard to synthesize, but nevertheless, I'll try just to give you an idea. There are three pictures on this slide, and they're all important in a way. The top left picture is of a is a, uh, the house of a very poor family on the gypsy settlement. So this village, this is the key piece of information, has a gypsy settlement. Meaning, if you look at the down here, that there have been Roma living on the side of the village for about 80 years now. Previously, they actually lived in the woods under, in very, I mean, terrible conditions. Um, but the socialist state, um, in the 60s, brought this community along with other communities from the forest into the village and put the Roma to work, mostly in factories. So people in this particular village worked in coal mines in the area or migrated to Budapest daily, so back and forth, um, to work in a textile factory. Um, that was women mostly, and the men went to the mines. There was other work in the area too, but mostly industrial work for men and also industrial for women, but, but not um, heavy industry, but light industry. And I'll say more about the Roma after 1990, but for now, just remember that they're present in the village. And until 1990, they had work and were actually treated as new Hungarians, as, as people who would, if they pursued their path of assimilation, integrate into the wider community. So there was a distinction, but the lines were blurred between, or began to be blurred between Roma and non-Roma. There were intermarriages, there was daily contact, um, there was befriending at the workplaces and after work. And what about the rest of the village? So the other picture is a also an icon of what post-peasant agriculture looks like. So this is the house of a woman who has a very important standing in the village. She's very revered and respected. She's a leading representative of these post-peasants. In the socialist period, these people tried to somehow maintain um, their ties to the land, mostly by having private plots. And in this particular area, it was mostly wine that was cultivated. Um, most of that produce was not made by private land owners. The land was not privately owned, but everyone could have a small private plot on the hill be behind the Roma settlement, which you see is barren today. And I'll say more about that. But this hill used to be plenty of, of grapes. Wine used to be made by post peasants like this woman who then brought her produce to the market in either in Budapest or in the nearby town and sold it. So even though the socialist state fostered also the proletarization of former peasant workers, there were people who really tried to maintain their heritage of 
of agriculture and everything that goes around it. It also, I mean, it's also a very conservative village um, where the Catholic church has a very uh, strong roots. Um, and even during socialism, people went to church. So these are the two groups that mostly live in the village. Um, the Roma make up about 10%, 10, 15% of the population. And so what happens after 1989? And I'll try to be brief, but I'll talking about these two groups. So one, the Roma, they lose their workplaces um, because the heavy industry is largely dismantled after 1989. And the post-socialist state doesn't really know what to do with them. Um, but what it does is that it provides them just enough subsidies so, to ensure their, their social reproduction so that they can feed themselves, so that their children can go to school, so that they have clothing, but they really have no other prospect than that of integrating anymore. They've lost, lost their workplaces. So they live from unemployment benefits and from collecting this or that in the forest. But with time, this is a this is a post post socialist and increasingly neoliberal welfare state that is supposedly universal, but nevertheless gives less and less money to the deep poor. And some of the Roma families, three or four in particular, um, resort to stealing. And actually, there's a pretty there's a consensus in the village about who the thieves are um, among Roma and Ron Roma. Um, and the local community tries to deal with this difficult situation, um, which really is complicated when, because it's the police that should be dealing with thievery, but the police has other problems in this. In the 90s, it is also massively underfunded and they really have other stuff to deal with. So what, what you should have in mind is 20, 30 kilos of fruit being stolen by Roma from the hill behind. Um, it doesn't hurt the post peasants really. I mean, in terms of, it does hurt them morally, but it doesn't hurt um, economically, they can survive. And for a while, the, live, the, the, the village lives with this situation. But then there is a change, um, and this is with the crisis actually. And now I'll come to the other group to say why they become fed up with Roma thieves. So, what, after 1990, what was promised by the new elites to the post peasants, so people who wanted to keep this agricultural tradition alive was that they would get their land back and there was a privatization process and that they eventually could maybe even build viable enterprises and maybe even export their produce if it's good enough. Now, what happened is after 2004, Hungary, Hungary's entry into the EU, well, it was quite the opposite. Actually, the Hungarian market was flooded by cheap Italian, French, even Chilean wine. And these people found that they could not even sell their own wine on the local market. So you start seeing, this is a before and after period from the same hill behind the Roma settlement. This is around 2000, this is around 2010. What you see is the disappearance of these cellar houses where the wine is being made and, and, and then later transported. So people actually start giving up their petty enterprises. And this is mostly because they simply cannot compete on this market um, where Western European peasants are at this point subsidized by the EU. And for a very long time, the Hungarian peasants weren't given the similar amount of subsidies. But of course, people don't blame the, an abstract entity like the EU when they see Roma going up on the hill and taking roof tiles from the hill. They start narrating this crisis as a Roma problem, as a thief problem, and as a Roma problem increasingly, even though it's not all the Roma who steal, far from it. And this is the discourse I think what's peculiar to this locality is that this discourse was born quite early, according to my research, already the early 2000, I mean, 2004, 2006. Actually, 2006 is the key year. And on the national level, it's actually from 2006 that you see this right-wing party and earlier local mayors really coming out with a new narrative about the need to 
put Roma back into their place is how it's often put. Recreate order in a place where there is no order because if there are thieves looming about and destroying wine cellars, then that is definitely a disorderly place. And the last piece of this puzzle uh, that I think is important, that I found important from my own research, and then really I won't say more, is that in this period when there are these tensions arising between these two groups, so surplus, racialized surplus population, criminalized and racialized surplus populations on the one hand, and the post-peasants who are on a downward mob mobility or trajectory, on, there's a decline in their social uh, life in their livelihoods and also in, in their social power. It is exactly in this period where the liberal state starts to emancipate Roma. So, for instance, in the local school, they try to desegregate the school where Roma had been going on one level. The classes for Roma were on the top of the school and the Magyars or, or Hungarians, non-Roma, were on the bottom of the school. And you see the, for the principal on the right who was I know her well, she was a proponent of this integration policy. She struggled to convince the local population that this was a good idea to mix the Roma and the non-Roma. But there was a lots of state funding for this integration policy. So things went along for quite some time. But eventually this triggered also a major conflict in the village and why. The story is somewhat similar to I don't know if any of you know Arlie Hochschild's work from the US, where she did research in also in rural areas. And she has this concept of a deep grammar, which she calls this deep grammar or deep story, sorry, deep story of native sections of the population that is non-immigrants, non-minority sections of the population starting to narrate their situation as being negatively Disc discriminated by a state that is positively discriminating the Roma. So you have a triad of state, minority, and native population, and the conflict starts brewing within this triad, this triangle. You need a state that is perceived to be helping an undeserving minority. And this is exactly what is happening in not only in Hungary, but also in the US and many other parts of the world. And this is a vicious circle, actually, um, especially at a time of crisis. And of course, it's during a time of cri crisis that these narratives gain traction. And I saw, or, or I only arrived in the village in 2011, so actually post-fact, but I was able to recollect um, or to collect the narratives from the local newspaper, also from people's um, own memory about how difficult the situation was. And I was, I have been on particularly good terms with this woman who actually lost her battle, her the battle of narratives to convince people that it's good, it's a good idea to keep the Roma together with the, or to mix the Roma with the non-Roma. And increasingly the school and even the, the teachers there were perceived as as an alien force, although they were locals, but as serving an elite that was distant from the native population and served cosmopolitan interests. The story is similar. I'm sure you've heard it in other places. In Western Europe, there are similar stories um, around the criminalization of, of minorities. And this is exactly what happened in this period in Hungary. In other words, the conclusion is here that the liberal emancipation really came at a, at a really bad time um, because it, it happened in a, in, a, in a situation of crisis. And at the same time as the state was, was withdrawing support from rural areas, um, I don't wanna go into that, but that, that was the case that there was, a, there was a rampant neoliberalization process. So the state being more and more distant from these areas at the same time, it comes in to emancipate a minority. This is not exactly the right way to do it, is what we learned from this. Um, you need a strong welfare state presence if you want to succeed with an emancipation. Politics is my takeaway from this period. And it was, of course, the exact opposite. Um, so on this slide, I really just, I think we can jump because I just wanted to 
reiterate what, what I've basically said. So, you know, is it, there are these two important groups that basically come into conflict with each other on the local level and indirectly through the state, which I just tried to explain. So vying for the resources and attention of the state with each other um, is this critical juncture into which this anti-Roma politics of the right wing, far right wing party um, jumps in. And I just wanna underline this issue of that this is a, a crisis of, of, this is a moral cri experienced as a moral crisis on behalf of the post peasants, as I call them. Um, and I really, I, I have this interview, which is, was one of my most fabulous interviews with an old lady. And one of the things she told me was, well, look, uh, she called me son. Um, look, son, until now I thought, or we thought that it was hard work and hard work only that gets you ahead in life. That's what I learned in my childhood before socialism. That's what the socialists taught us. And now what I see is that this actually is no longer working. This what I see is that people who don't work hard get the attention and resources of the state. And she said, and I heard this often, I'm not against the gypsies, but this is unjust. Um, and we really, see, I, I think this, this is the key of the puzzle here, um, that there is, there is a politics and a series of political and economic processes that grind against common sense, come into conflict with common sense. And, you know, common sense, if I'm just referring back to Gramsci, is, is a historically constituted way of being in, in the world, seeing the world. You know, if, if habitus is Bourdieu's way of talking about the non-reflected um, subconscious elements of um, one's cognition and being in the world, this is the more cognitive aspect. And Gramsci shows us that it's historically formed. And it's important that people talk about hard work because they come from a peasant background. Peasants and, and also workers, industrial workers, they're, they're, they have this very strong work ethic. They really believe what is in this sentence that basically um, social benefits, and I'm, when I mean benefits, I mean in an abstract sense, should be commensurable to the effort you make. And when they, make, when they talk about effort, it's physical labor mostly. So basically, they found themselves living in a world where they saw this maxim as threatened. And so they lived this as not only a period of crisis or social crisis, but as a deep moral crisis. And I would even say as they felt that their world was breaking down. And this is where rural mayors and Orban's call for building a work-based society, I think, now maybe begins to make sense. It's to return to a society where work and the ethic of work are the basis of social life and social and remuneration, both symbolic and financial. And this is, I'm, I'm coming to the last part of my talk. Um, and I just wanted to show you, so what, is, what does this public work program look like in practice? And it really had three phases. So I already mentioned that its first phase was punishment here. What you see is these are photos from the village. These are all Roma working. Here you see them working in the land, you know, basically removing shrub from around the village, cleaning roads, and also cleaning, you don't see them here, but tidying the streets of the village. And on the, right, on the bottom right, you see them, you see a pile of firewood that has been collected by the public workers, which will later be distributed to the elderly post peasants. So this is what basically wor the work-based society looks like, bringing people who were unemployed back into the service of the local community, getting them or putting their work to the service of local needs. And the reason, the reason I, I, I talk about punitive populism in the paper, I just mentioned punishment here, is in the beginning, there was really a very strong anti-Roma um, subtext to this, to this program. There was a lot of harassment of the people working um, for absolutely no reason. It was also a way to show to the broader community and the wider world, which was watching through television cameras, this particular village, is that the Roma were being put back into their place. And this lasted until about 2014. 
maybe a bit earlier, this is not a clear cut divide. I don't wanna go into it, but in the paper I describe and explain why there was a, re a diminishing return of this punitive policy. Um, but basically the key point is that the local mayor, not only here, but in other places as well, started to realize that this punishing project um, had already paid its dividends, that people and them were now expecting something more. Um, and what this, what this more was, was that the program contributes more to community development. And the local mayor under, who was associated with the far right party tried to switch the program in that direction, but didn't have time to make this transition because uh, he was voted out of office in 2014 and Fidesz's candidate won the election. So that was a symbolic moment, of course, very highly um, popularized by Fidesz saying we've vanquished the far right threat. And between 2014 and 2018, um, the local mayor with the help of central state funding built a garden where produce was, go was grown, mostly lettuce, vegetables that were then sent to the kitchen and local kids would eat it. And this happened all over the country. So you see the emergence of quasi small enterprises, state funded, but catering to the local community needs. Um, you also had chickens. And again, you see this all over the place. So an effort to really use the project for community development and for really reincorporating the Roma population as more and more into the social fabric. And I think this is very important. I found this to be very important. And I say a few words about why the Roma were willing to participate in this. So why there was a consensus around this project. But just briefly, um, this period didn't last very long because, uh, and I'm, I'm winding down the talk, so I've, I think I've already talked for 40 minutes. So I'll, I'll try to make it quicker here. Um, but this last phase, which has been going on since about 2018, so the last parliamentary cycle, the whole workfare program began to be wound down because there was an uptick in economic development. And the broader picture is that there was a reindustrialization of the whole Eastern periphery of EU already catching speed at this time, mostly actually German car manufacturers coming into Hungary and other countries to build new cars here. Um, this was a direct outcome of the global economic crisis. Um, so a switching around of, uh, of global value chains and Hungary was a key beneficiary of that. And so the states tried to push some of the public workforce into the factories again, as the socialists had done. And it was more or less successful at that. And so the primary way to do that was to have less workplaces in the workfare program. And it turned out that the best people, the, the people who mayors really relied on to do the most of the work were the ones who left the first to go and work in the factories where they could earn much more money. And so these small enterprises that you saw in the previous picture, actually, instead of becoming autonomous and um, economically viable ended up collapsing. And that's what happened in this village and in very, very many other villages. So that project of local development, rural development failed. And what you have in place is flower beds on the main streets and mostly women public workers, female public workers tending to these flowers. So there is this beautification of villages that the program is now engaged in. Um, which I find to be very interesting because people are quite positive about this. They actually, this gives them the feeling that there is a dynamic in their village, that, they're, that there's, there's a positive thing happening, despite the fact that actually the local economy is suffering to some extent from the de departure of public workers, especially in places where, you know, you don't have new factories, um, you don't have a new BMW factory nearby. But this beautification process linked to the program really counterbalances this, I found, to a major extent. And I know another anthropologist who has done great work on this beautification. Um, she just finished her PhD um, uh, at CU. So, and here I'm coming basically to the end. 
the last qu thing I want to talk about is why we're why we're all stakeholders party to the game. Because you could expect Roma to say, you know, I don't want to be part of this thing that is partially stigmatizing. After all, I do have to wear this yellow wet vest um, and show people that I'm only a second class citizen. But actually, what the Roma workers I talk to, and this clings, this chimes with the findings of other anthropologists, is that most unskilled workers, poor people were quite happy to take part in the program because it offered small but stable income. And especially women could, so men and women could juggle quite well with this program. It's often now the women who stay in the program. The men go and work in the factories and the, that factory work is difficult and not always something that they can keep up. It's really hard work, uh, usually three shifts. And so the men usually stay for six months, a year, and then they stop working. And when they stop working, the women's income matters a lot, even though if it's only 200 euros, but their stable income is what keeps the household really going. So that's one of the main reasons that poor work, unskilled workers were willing to remain in this program, despite the stigma. And the other is that it does provide a, a minimum of social recognition to people. So the elderly lady who I mentioned saying, you know, people who don't work shouldn't get any bread. She's actually quite positive about this, not only the program, but Roma themselves saying, you know, there's actually Roma who I find to be deserving these days. They do good work for the community. So there's this element of recognition for even maybe social membership, we could go as far as to say that the program affords to remember people who were previously marginalized, socioeconomically excluded, whom the liberals tried to emancipate, but really didn't take it, this project fully forwards. It was a rather half-hearted attempt focusing on schools, but they really didn't know what, to, what else to do with this workforce. And it seems that public work offers them some kind of um, yeah, recognition and, 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 and livelihood. The mayors are interested in this because they can recruit the public workers as clients. So, and often this is important for their reelection every four years. So the, they can choose who is part of the program and this process of selection often comes with a give and take. So there's a transactionalist aspect to this relation between mayors and public workers. The mayor says, look, you get the job, just support me whenever election time comes, that's all I'm asking. And you know what, you'll even get a bit of firewood or some other benefits during these four years if you require. Mayors would sometimes give a lift to people, um, their public workers who couldn't afford to take their kids, for example, to the nearby hospital. So there is this really give and take between mayors and public workers that benefits mayors to a very large extent. And the ruling party has also indirectly benefited from this because it has recruited rural mayors as clients, asking them to recruit their public workers as voters at election time. So not only do these people support the local mayor, and often these local mayors are quasi-independent or formally independent, but they really act as brokers bringing voters um, in support of Fidesz every four years. So that's why they like the program. And I think it's obvious why post peasants like the program because they get, well, now only flower beds, but even that is better um, than nothing, it seems. So conclusions, um, I hope that, you know, one thing that you've gotten away from what I've said in these last 45, 50 minutes is that there is a consensual element in Fidesz's politics of governmental power or societal project. And maybe there's definitely not only workfare, but this public work program is definitely one of them. Basically, everyone is happy with this program, at least on the in local communities. And this workfare policy is really not, or shouldn't really be interpreted in a neoliberal lens, I say. As I said, it's, it's not really about economically mobilizing a population in the sense of 
pushing them onto the primary work uh, or workplaces, uh, labor market, but a state financed means of supporting local communities in a way and helping local mayors create these local hegemonies, reestablish these local hegemonies through central state funding. That's what it's about. And that's why it's not like classic neoliberal workfare. And I think this last aspect, which I just briefly mentioned, but which is an important part of my work, this clientelism is important because it shows that, you know, these are asymmetric power relations between mayors and clients, but there is, there's an element of give and take and, and clients do get something out of this relationship. And I think we need a broader analysis of this, what I would call this hierarchical reincorporation strategy that authoritarians, I think not only in Hungary are pursuing. And I see this as, as, as something that we should research more. And I think that's potentially very important um, for understanding why people consent to these regimes. They do get something out of these relations. So thanks and